Jonathan Ashworth, you were active in the Labour Party from the age of 15. Now, I know you quite well, but if I had read that for the first time, I'd think this is a total weirdo. <laughs> well, thank you for that question. I mean, I mean, I joined the Labour Party, yes, when I was, when I was 15. And I think, as we thinking about this, you get some Labour pol politicians who say they chose the Labour Party. You get other Labour politicians who say the, they were born into the Labour Party. Looking back, I sort of feel like the Labour Party adopted me <laughs> because I had a difficult time growing up. My dad had a, a drink problem, which I've talked about. Also, by the time when I'm sort of 15, 16, 17, it's quite a difficult time at home because my dad's drink problem had led to the divorce of my parents. My mum got involved with another man and they were going through a very messy breakup at that period. I don't really know what exactly went on, but there was a period when um, uh, I had to leave that house and go and live full time with my dad. My mum disappeared for a while. So it was obviously a very traumatic period for my mum. And, you know, I, I was a teenager who, who just thought there's these huge... Um, injustices in life, unfairnesses in life. I mean, why was it in the area we, where I grew up, a place called Radcliffe in, in North Manchester, why were uh, the, the schools falling apart? Why did we not get the same opportunities that the kids who went to Manchester Grammar School or Berry Grammar School would get? And I wanted a fairer society, but this was a period of great trauma for me. I was dealing on the one hand with my dad's drinking, on the other hand with my mum in this very difficult relationship, her disappearing. And I suppose the Labour Party was like, became like a family. Didn't have a family really up until that point because I was an only child and was dealing with a lot of issues on my own. So going along to these various <laughs> Labour Party meetings, I loved it. And I got myself onto the local branch meeting, the local constituency meeting, the local district meeting. I wanted to go to all these meetings. I got myself elected as an observer to the Labour um, Council. I mean, all the stuff when I was 15, 16, 17, I was obsessed with it because it gave my diary for the week some stability, it gave me something to focus on, it gave me something, something to do to sort of turn my mind away from what often felt like chaos at home. When you weren't at Labour Party meetings, you're going through these periods of trauma. Do, are you at Labour Party meetings because you don't want to think about what's going on in your life? So you think, I I'm not going to engage with this trauma. I'm going to throw myself into this. Or I mean, you must have had dark moments when you go to bed at night and you, your dad's drunk. Or I mean, no, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not treating the low party like a counselling service. But uh, and I was, I am absolutely convinced and remain convinced that if you want to improve society and give everybody the best chance in life, then you need Labour governments in power. And this was the mid-90s, it was 1995, 1996. We were determined to get into power after... Uh, with, with a government that had run out of steam, was Jonathan, scandalous, Jonathan, was rotten. Jonathan, you see, I want to talk to you about the real you. And it's interesting that you are going to the politics. Yeah. And I want to, uh, and I know it's hard, but I want to try and make you focus on what you were going through emotionally at a time when your parents are getting divorced at 15. No, my parents got divorced when I was about eight or nine. But only when you're 15 you go and live with your Yeah, dad. so they, they split up and I, and I spend my week bouncing between the two. And then when I'm a sort of 16 sort of age, um, 16, 17, I think, um, my mother finally leaves the relationship she's in. It's very difficult. And then I end up going living full time with my dad. But even throughout that period, you see, remember, my dad's worked in a casino, right? During uh, this time, yeah, your dad's da working in the casino in at, at, at night. Yeah. So what that means is when you're with your dad, um, these are long hours, these are shifts, these are night shifts. And well, that essentially means that throughout a lot of the daytime, when he returns home at 4 a.m., he has to sleep throughout the day. And then when he's awake, he's often turning to drink. So you end up growing up pretty quickly. You end up taking responsibility for yourself um, because it's not just the drink bit, it's the fact that if you're working shifts, that impacts on your ability as a parent to spend time, spend time with your children. And I was just, I was reflecting on this at the weekend. I, you know, I helped my children with their homework. I actually took my oldest daughter, who's, a te who's 10, to the Remembrance Sunday. Thinking, looking back, I don't 
ever recall my parents helping me with homework or taking me to something. I mean, they wouldn't necessarily go to Remembrance Sunday because they're not MPs, but you know what I mean? Some sort of community type event like that because it's, there's so many other things going on in their lives. There's the working in the casino and there's the drinking and there's my mum's situation with the, the new man she got involved in. Was he ever your stepfather? Well, I suppose, um, I, I mean, technically he would have been, um, but, you know, the relationship broke down with my mum and I've never seen him, heard of him since. Um, but it was obviously quite difficult because there was a period when I, when, as I say, she, she, she left me, disappeared for a while. So your dad worked in a casino. What did your mum do? Well, my mum, uh, I mean, by this point, my mum's just on benefits. Um, but my mum met my dad because they were both working in the Playboy Casino in 1970s Manchester. She was a bunny girl. My dad was a croupier and then became a pit boss. So they worked in the Manchester Playboy Club together. And the stories you hear from them are quite extraordinary. Really. This is sort of 1970s Manchester, the glamour of Man United, the glamour of uh, various comedians coming in in there. My mum tells a story, it shows how appalling attitudes were then and how things have changed, that every week the bunny girls would have to line up uh, and be weighed uh, by the head bunny or whatever the head bunny girl was called to make sure they hadn't put on weight. I and mean, it's absolutely really? terrible. My and my dad all had all these wonderful stories about working in the Playboy Club in 70s Manchester. I remember this is the time, do you remember that famous picture of George Best pouring champagne on all the champagne glasses surrounded yeah, by bunny yeah, girls? Yeah. Now, that wasn't actually the Manchester Playboy Club, but it's that period, that captures this period. And my dad tells these stories, and I, and I don't know if this story has been kind of exaggerated or it's not quite right with the telling, but this is how it got told to me, um, that if you remember the famous... Um, Jamie Thorpe case. Yes. Jamie Thorpe was at Neil Bailey for accused of trying to murder his lover, lover and the dog ended up getting shot. He was defended by a remarkable barrister called George Carman, famous barrister. And so the story is, and it had probably been exaggerated in the telling over the years, but so the story is... From your dad? From my dad. That the night before he was defending Thorpe in London, Carman was at the roulette table at the Playboy Club in Manchester with a load of bundles of his legal papers on the roulette table. And I don't know what time the clubs closed then. They're open all night now, but in them days, I can't imagine they shut at two or three, I don't know. Uh, my dad had to bundle Carmen out of the Playboy Club into a black cab all the way down to London in order to defend Jeremy Thorpe the next day. Now, there's probably some exaggeration in that story, but there's probably, again, there's probably an element of truth in it one way or another. And it's things like that. My dad had all these wonderful stories. So he was a wonderful man. He was a sort of a great character. Um, I love being in his company, but he just couldn't help but allow himself to be gripped by drink and alcohol. How old were you when you when you realised this? I mean, quite young. I remember there was a period when he was drinking a bottle of whiskey a day, Canadian club whiskey uh, a day, um, and he ended up in hospital, probably what was then called Crumpsall Hospital, now North Manchester General. I remember going to visit him in hospital. How old? I don't know. About Six, seven, that's Oh, my gosh. Age. That young. And, they don't, and I, I didn't really understand what was happening at the time, but subsequently I learned that the doctors basically said to him, you're going to die unless you pack the drinking in. He didn't pack the drinking in, but he moved from whiskey, Canadian whiskey, to uh, white wine. And then throughout my childhood, the, the fridge would always be just full of these big bottles of cheap white wine from the off-licence. There were times when that's all there was in. Oh, that was in the fridge. I'd come over and that's always, I'd be like, God. Was there always tea made for you? Like, do you always have a, a, a decent meal when you were living with your dad? There was food, but I often, I often had to go to the shop and get my, buy the food, buy, buy, the, buy it as well. He'd give you a, a, yeah. a bit of money and say, go and get some yeah. food, go and get some food for yourself. But he was never abusive. No. And there was never dem violence. No. There was nothing like that. And he was... <laughs> I don't know, there's probably, somebody can probably do some sort of psychological research into it, but he was a clever man who, you know, failed his 11 plus. He could have done so much more in life. The reason he got a job, he started off on the docks in Salford. The reason he got a job in the casinos when the casinos opened up, because he was good at maths. He could add up the, you know, yeah. you know, the, the, what, you know if, you put, if you've won on roulette, he could add up how much the, the punter has won and things like that. He was good at maths. So he always talked to me any, about politics, 
about society. It was quite philosophical, but I don't know. Alcohol is, it can be fun, but when you, it's fun if you're at a party or whatever, but when you're just there with your dad, time after time, night after night, it gets you down because it's, you know, there we go again, drinking too much. Did you cry yourself to sleep? I didn't cry myself to sleep. Did you shut off? Well, I think I probably shut off. Um, you don't really know what to do. Don't really know who to speak to. I remember ringing Childline. Really? And then uh, I'll just let it ring. And then I thought, oh, no, I can't do this. So I put the phone down. I remember going to a phone box at, next to the bus, the bus stop at, in Radcliffe outside the, the church. And... How old are you at this point? Probably about 12 or something. So young. But you... It, like if you but remember when you were a child, if you don't know anything else, you just get on with it. Don't you? You just, you just get on with it. You've got no there's option. No, there's no option. And I mean, you know, we had girlfriends who came and went. So sometimes you had a girlfriend who was there. You know, that was nice because obviously, but they the girlfriends eventually get fed up with his drinking. So there were periods when there was someone else there. The level of the drink abuse, it, it destroys everything in the end. And fast forward to when I'm thirty. I go home one Christmas to see him and he says to me, I'm going. I said, what? He said, I'm going to Thailand. I said, what do you mean on holiday? He said, no, to live. I'm like, you what? You're off your head. He went, no, I'm going. And he just literally went. So he was about 58 at this point. He just literally went. I thought, okay. Now, this point, by this point, I'm working for Gordon Brown and things like that, so he's gone. Every now and again, I'd get a Thai number would come up on my phone my dad ringing me from Thailand, drunk. Anyway. What did he say when he rang you? He loved you. Yeah, when you're coming over, it's great over here. What's going on? Oh, just drunk, drunk rubbish. The way drunk people speak. Um, anyway, and in the summer of 2010, it comes around, I get married. And my dad rings me two days before the wedding, goes, I'm not coming. So why? It's my wedding. I thought you booked a ticket. I've cancelled it. He said, I'm not coming, I'm not coming. Anyway, that was that. I, had, I was so angry with him. I said, oh, fine, you do what you want then. And I didn't speak to him. I was so furious at the wedding day. I didn't speak to him. I couldn't, couldn't speak to him on the day. And um, two months later, he was dead. I got a phone call on a Friday morning. The phone was ringing at 6am. So I looked at the number. It was a Thai number. I was like, oh, God, he's drunk again. The van kept, I didn't answer. I rang again, didn't answer. Answer it, it's, it's this woman. She says to you, are you Jonathan Asher? I said, yeah. Are you John Ash's son? I said, yeah. He said, um, and I knew, I knew. It's weird, isn't it? You know these things, isn't it? At that point, she said, I'm sorry. And I said, he's dead, isn't he? She said, yeah. And I said, what was it? And she said, Almost matter of factly, but not in a cruel way, and I don't blame her for it, this woman. She said, you do know your dad was an alcoholic, don't you? And of course I knew, because <laughs> I knew I'd grown up with it. But to hear those words said out loud in that way, it just sort of, it was like a punch in the stomach or, I don't know, a slap round the face. Or like a ton of bricks have come down on me. Yeah, and he was, what, 60? It's no age, is it? It's just drinking every day. Back on the whiskey. Thai whiskey this time. And then I subsequently heard, not from him, subsequently heard from, because I had to go over there and make the funeral arrangements and sort all out and deal with all the, the, you know, the bureaucracy of it all. I subsequently heard from the friends, the little group of them, that he couldn't come to the wedding. He felt he couldn't come to the wedding because he thought he would embarrass me in front of my posh friends because he thought he'd get so drunk that I'd be ashamed of him because at that wedding would have been, you know, Gordon Brown and other Labour MPs and journalists, you know, people who work in Westminster, people who 
to him, he would think they were posh because they went to university and talk in clever ways and use long words and have fancy jobs. He felt he couldn't come because he would embarrass me. He was my dad. Of course I wanted him. Anyway. Jonathan, right, okay, let's talk. Let me try and pull myself together as well, because I could have just, it's so evocative. I felt like I was there and thank you for being so open. Let me talk to you about the most incredible success that you have had in your life despite this. In your 20s, you are a special advisor <laughs> to the Chancellor of the Exchequer in a Labour government. I am, yeah. I mean, my goodness. You come, you, you come through that trauma, you do incredibly well at school, you turn all the trauma and you focus on ensuring you have a, a better life. What is it? It must have been mind-blowing. Oh, it was extraordinary. It was amazing. I couldn't believe it when I got the job. I was... I, just, I mean, I'd been... Yeah, I was 25. Um, I got a job at the Labour Party after university as a researcher. I did a... I did a a sort of student, a youth job for the Labour Party and then became a researcher and then an economics researcher and then I just got this opportunity from going, but I wasn't expecting, I didn't apply for it. They were looking for somebody and they offered me that role and I know you don't want me to be political but I mean, I'm immensely proud I worked for a Labour government that lifted a million children up out of poverty, pensioners out of poverty, that built sure start centres everywhere which invested, record investment in the NHS. We took waiting times down from 18 months to 18 weeks. Stop and, you, it. and you know what, but look, I know you say stop it, but I want to say this, for 10 years, my party has almost been embarrassed by the achievements of that government. I mean, you know, we had the, well, we've had the, some pretty miserable defeats, one of the worst defeat in our history. You know, I would, we've got to stop being embarrassed and start celebrating what that Labour government achieved. That's the best government of my lifetime. That made material difference to people who, from my background, from working class communities, did great things. And the Labour Party for 10 years has failed to talk about it and the Labour Party's got to start talking about it again. Not, to, not because we want to be uh, an historical reenactment society. We've got to build and put forward policies for the challenges of today. But my God, let's stop slagging off our achievements. That was a great government that redistributed wealth and lifted children out of poverty. That's a good thing. You came in shortly after me, so 11 years you've now spent in opposition. It's hard for it not to feel utterly meaningless. You're now the longest serving Labour Shadow Health Secretary <laughs> in history. Do you want the big job? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, very, I'm ambitious to be the Health Secretary. To, to, you know, a lot of your viewers, you know, probably live in places like, I don't know, Rotherham, Doncaster, yeah. Ashfield. Yeah. You know, in those areas, you're likely to live, you know, on, on balance, on average, 10 years less than someone in Surrey. You're more likely to have heart disease. You're more likely to have cancer. You're more likely to suffer from depression. That's not fair. We've got to do something about it. And that's what I want to sort out if I'm the health secretary. That's why I want to be the health secretary. And, you, and, you know, you can make a difference from opposition, not big differences. You need to be in government to make the big differences. You need to be in government to deal with this, these issues. Why is somebody in Ashfield has a lower life expectancy than somebody in, in Surrey? But one of the things that when I, did, when I spoke about alcohol, actually Jeremy Hunt got in touch with me, he was the health secretary, and he agreed to work with me on putting in place a support for children of alcoholics. And we put together a six million pound plan to support children of alcoholics. Um, and we actually announced it together as a joint press release. Can you imagine that? Health Secretary and the Shadow Health Secretary did a joint press. We announced it together on College Green. Unfortunately, he's really tall, I'm really short, so we look <laughs> utterly ludicrous on the TV screens. It was a bit like that, you know, that sort of two on his John Cleese <laughs> yeah. sketch, I look down on him and he I look up at him. It was a bit like that, because we just looked so ludicrous. But we've got six million quid to support children of alcohol. So you can make a difference, but you make a bigger difference by getting into government. And that's what I want to do. It shouldn't be right that if you're in Rotherham or Doncaster or Radcliffe, where I grew up, or Salford, where I was born, or Leicester, where I now live, that you're likely, just because of where you are born, to live, to get ill quicker and die sooner. That's not right. It's not fair. 
that men like my dad, who was born in 1949 in Salford, who didn't get to go to university, didn't even get to go to college, you know, for whatever reason, you know, got into the grip of alcohol abuse. But he got diabetes towards the end. He had other problems towards the end. It's not fair, it's not right that people in communities like that should suffer ill health just because where they are born, where they came from. We've got to change that. So yes, I'm ambitious, but I'm ambitious to be the health secretary. I don't want to be the longest serving shadow health secretary. I want to be the longest serving health secretary. Jonathan Ashworth, I thought that was an incredible exchange. Thank you. Thank you so much.